the mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. These are the famous words of defiant triumph spoken by Satan in John Milton's Paradise Lost. Having been imprisoned in hell, Satan declares that God really has no power over him, because Satan can adapt to any circumstance that God throws at him. His outer circumstances cannot define him or make him miserable. If Satan wants to turn hell into heaven, he can, simply with the power of his own mind, and thus, God is thwarted. This is a profound statement about the flexibility of the mind, and our capacity to interpret our circumstances in different ways, especially through the lenses of different values. Is it better to serve in heaven, or is it better to reign in hell? Well, it depends on your values. Different values lead to different ways of seeing things, and arguably, different paths to happiness. We've already seen so many theories of happiness, from Plato to the Stoics, from the Transcendentalists to Aristotle. And we haven't even mentioned ancient Eastern views of happiness, or modern theories of happiness, like hedonism theory, desire theory, objective list theory, life satisfaction theory, emotional state theory, and the list goes on and on. Such a preponderance of viewpoints seems to suggest that, to at least some degree, happiness is subjective. It seems the human mind is able to nimbly twist itself into any shape in order to reconcile itself to any circumstance, to find happiness in anything, or to find misery in anything. We can be surrounded by great things but make ourselves miserable. Conversely, we can be mired in misery and make it heaven. We always find ways to paint ourselves in the best or worst light. No matter how pathetic we might be, we make ourselves the heroes of our own stories. No matter how blessed we might be, we make ourselves tragic victims. We can take any heaven and make it into a hell, or we can take any hell and make it into a heaven. While this might sound optimistic at first, this is not necessarily a good thing. In fact, for John Milton, this adaptability, even when it's positive, demonstrates the absurdity of conscious being, whether angelic, satanic, or human. It's about our capacity for self-delusion. For Milton, Satan, the embodiment of evil, is fundamentally the embodiment of self-delusion. Readers of Paradise Lost are always surprised by how heroically Milton portrays Satan, the ultimate bad guy. Satan is rebellious and defiant. He is an individualist. He believes in his own brand of freedom. He is a warrior and a leader, ambitious, clever, and resourceful. And we like that about him. Satan seems to be the quintessential hero. Of course, the fact that we admire Satan may only indicate that we ourselves are more satanic than we think. Milton's Christianity taught that evil is not only repulsive, but also attractive. So it's no wonder that Satan, as the embodiment of evil, should hold some attraction for us. However, careful readers will notice that Milton does not portray Satan as entirely heroic. In fact, he often portrays Satan as quite pathetic. Satan becomes a perverted peeping Tom voyeur who watches Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He becomes a groveling trespasser who is taken by the scruff of the neck and tossed out of paradise. He's a little punk who talks big and arouses heaven to rebel against God, but in his first battle is knocked down with a single blow from the Archangel Michael and has to be carried off the battlefield by others to safety. Milton writes the character of Satan in such a way that whenever Satan is by himself, alone with his own thoughts, or with his sniveling cronies, he seems heroic. But the moment he is in the presence of others, especially in the presence of true goodness, he is completely pathetic. Satan's heroism is not a real heroism, but a delusion, and a delusion which cannot last. The vital moment of self-awareness comes when Satan, having escaped hell and braved the abyss of chaos, finally arrives in our world, in the Garden of Eden, where joy forever dwells. And we would expect this moment to be triumphant. We would expect Satan to be pleased with himself at least. After all, he is in paradise where we would expect he would find happiness. But that's not what happens. Satan is surprised to find that, upon arriving in paradise, he is still miserable, maybe even more miserable than ever before. And like a devilish engine back recoils upon himself, horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts, and from the bottom stir the hell within him. For within him, hell he brings, and round about him. Nor from hell, one step no more than from himself can fly by change of place. Now conscience wakes despair that slumbered, wakes the bitter memory of what he was, what is, and what must be worse, of worse deeds, worse sufferings, must ensue. What we thought was a bold escape from hell was not an escape at all. Indeed, Satan cannot escape hell, because hell exists inside him. Which way I fly, 
is hell. Myself am hell, and in the lowest deep, a lower deep still threatening to devour me opens wide, to which the hell I suffer seems a heaven. For Milton, hell is not so much a place as it is a state of being, first and foremost. Hell is not around a person, but within him. Conscious agents are the creators of hell. When God condemns a person, he condemns that person to himself. God only sends people to the hell that they themselves make, punished in the shape he sinned. Now to understand exactly how this works in Milton's mind, we have to go back to Aristotle. Remember that Aristotle's theory of happiness states that happiness is good character and right action. In order to be happy, you have to act a certain way. If you are virtuous, you will be happy. But if you are a bad person, you will be unhappy. That's because vices are actions, character traits, desires, and emotions which make us miserable. They are the courses of action which are easy but don't make us happy. Think of cowardice, which allows us to be tyrannized by fear, makes our lives a living nightmare, and keeps us from doing the things that we really want to do but are afraid to do. Think of laziness, which is easy but steals our life from us by making us indolent. Vices are the unfettered emotions which are satisfying but also strangely painful. Think of the unleashed burning of malice and hatred, or the unsettling, discontented drive of ambition, or the prideful need to be better than everyone else. These can cause us to make bad decisions and might even make us ruin our lives. But what will not ambition and revenge descend to? Who aspires must down low as high he soared, obnoxious first and last to basest things. Revenge, at first though sweet, bitter, ere long back on itself recoils. Vices are those powerful lusts which make us burn and desire without satisfaction. People who constantly chase after pleasure are like the starving man, Tantalus, in Hades, who is tortured with fruit that is always just out of his grasp. He is always hungry, but he can never be satisfied. His desire is his torture. To borrow from the Buddha's famous fire sermon, we can think of hell as the burning fire of lust, or the fire of hatred, the fire of delusion, the burning of sorrow and lamentation, pain, dejection, and despair. Buddhism tries to escape this internal hell, like Satan, through the power of the mind, specifically by becoming dispassionate. But for Milton, the solution is actually to live virtuously. Only add deeds to thy knowledge answerable. Add faith, add virtue, patience, temperance, add love, by name to come called charity, the soul of all the rest. Then wilt thou not be loath to leave this paradise, but shalt possess a paradise within thee, happier far. Just as hell is not external, but internal, paradise is not an external locale, but an internal reality. Milton sees virtuous obedience to God as a reenactment of the creation story, a recreation of paradise. Only this time, it is not the Garden of Eden that is being recreated. It is the individual who is being recreated. An Edenic paradise is established more and more within the person. By acting virtuously, by being patient, temperate, by rejoicing in everything, by valuing the truth, by exuberantly loving other people, we can have a paradise within us greater than the quintessential paradise of Eden. And this is the essence of Christian happiness, according to John Milton.